seven o'clock. I'll call to order this meeting on uh, February 5th, 2024 of the Waterbury Select Board. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda. Um, I'll second that and propose two additions um, after housing task force objectives. If we could add a discussion on the use of the school as a polling location and also review of the FEMA buyout. Okay. So I hear a second on the amendment. Second. Voting on the amendment, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, now we're voting on the uh, agenda as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as amended. Next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda for the minutes of the January 29th meeting as well as a second class license and tobacco license for AGS. AGS, come on. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, consent agenda is approved as written. Next is the public session. Anyone that would like to address anything that is not on the warrant agenda, you can please come forward. Uh, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Um, I mentioned it to Alyssa the other night at the meeting there on the, on the armory, um, and that other meeting that we had at the fire station. I'm wondering if the select board might have the, or would have the stomach to do a 10-year projection of what the town would be looking at as far as costs um, for the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, with fire, each of the department heads try to put together the best idea that they have as far as <laughs> what they might have to have. As far as Additional costs truck because of truck, the, re uh, truck replacements, uh, fire truck replacements, town town equipment replacements, anything that any of the departments may have in in their vision as far as road upgrades, uh, maintenance on buildings, you know, any, any big ticket items. I know um, Gary mentioned something about the um, heat system for, a partial heat system for one of the, f the fire departments, um, mm -hmm. an upgrade for that or furnace replacement. Just some idea of a projection for the next decade. Uh, as, a, as a taxpayer and a citizen, I'm starting to get concerned um, I don't know if there's a way of putting the pieces of the puzzle together to get a, a, a projection for the next decade. Um, the school, the school systems are becoming uh, an issue. I heard on the radio the other day that because uh, I was talking about trying to get an idea of where that might that that whole uh, entity might be headed in the next ten years, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, they talked about the state was looking at the disrepair of all, all the school buildings in the state and they're proposing a 300 million dollar a year expenditure for the next 21 years consecutive to bring schools up to par um, so that's that, that's a huge number in, in this equation and then you've got your year over year budgeting for your school systems uh, affordable housing is an issue uh, all these things factor into sustainability whether or not as taxpayers what we can actually afford to stomach uh, before we're pushed out or have to do right now the way I see it we're we're living on a year over year band-aid at best uh, you know trying to get through one year uh, mm -hmm. we've got bridges that need repaired you know and then then there's fudge factors for inflationary things uh, housing is projected to go up another 3.5 percent this year um, just a lot of numbers that even though we're the select board you deal with the municipality there's other entities that are also impact us heavily uh, and as taxpayers it'd be nice and if there's a way I can help with part of that uh, if you do decide to maybe think about entertaining it um, I'll do what I can to try to get some numbers together uh, but I think we're headed into some unprecedented times with costs uh, and 
I don't I don't know if we have the ability to, to burden them. So okay. thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Mike. Chris, what would you be looking at the ten year projection? Because I know if like for instance the armory, if like you're talking about that, that's supposed to be ninety days. You know, it's not. You, you know, Our armory isn't even in. It's okay. in there, but it's not. I, you know, schools are really an outside issue to mm -hmm. us. Anything that impacts us, I can understand yeah. if you're looking at us looking at long-term improvements to systems based upon the growth of the community. Well, yeah, we got okay. we got issues that we're going to have to take care of as a municipality, and how are we going to fund those? How many bonds are we going to take out? Uh, how is that going to impact our tax rate, let alone with just some givens from the, you know, from the education side of things? Uh, who knows how this state education proposal is going to, going to settle out before it's done, what, what the impact of that is going to be. And that doesn't even start to address the disrepair of the school systems and, and what they're, the $300 million they're talking about. You know, year over year for the next 20 years. Well, I think years. anything in the school system, in the school budget, doesn't technically impact our municipality. It comes out of our pockets. Well, it comes out of, yes, we all, I know we all that. pay for I know taxes. Exactly. No, I'm not asking We don't provide the least thing to take on the education end of it. Tom, um, there's got to be a way that we. You can and I have talked about uh, the paving plan going forward several years in advance. Uh, yeah. Gary's got a plan for replacing his trucks uh, going forward. Uh, what do you think about uh, Chris's request? To, to ten years, I think, is, is too many unknowns. I think ten years is yeah. too far. Mm -hmm. um, most towns that have capital plans look, look forward three years. Five might be five. a bit of an exception. Um, Could we, we can certainly pull together some figures like on a three to five year plan? Are you, are you thinking be, because it's, uh, I, I get your point, there's too many unforeseens, and, but I think there's, there's basics yep, as far as, I'm sure Gary's got an idea of what trucks are going to need replaced on their, you yeah, know, their we, cycle that they We have all that, that's, that's our most expensive yeah. item. How, 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 is, how is this new ambulance building going to impact us because our per capita is going up? Um, what else are you know are we going to be responsible for that? I think I think if we have an overall just a basic plan in place, you probably could plug in a fudge factor for inflationary things that would at least give us some clue as to you know. All right. Well, let's see what we can do. Uh, we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. All right. Any other comments from the public? Anything not on the warning agenda? Hearing none, let's move on to the uh, what, what the Flood update. Tom, do you have uh, more specifics on the uh, this <coughs> sure. February 10th event? Have people seen the flyer? I have not. It's not oh, a flyer. Flyer. Ooh, very powerful. <coughs> but you'll be seeing it out there. Uh, February 10th, 6 to 9. Um, there will be a substantial amount of donated food at the event, but there will also be some food purchased for the event because you probably want something other than brownies. Um, not to denigrate brownies, I'll eat about five of them. <coughs> um, six to nine at the Legion. Um, it's, I think, going to be a pretty lighthearted, fun event. There will be some, some speakers, I think, making brief remarks. Um, but I think overall, it's, um, it's lighthearted food, music, enjoyable. Thank you to the volunteers. Um, cash par, um, and anyone is invited, if you were flooded, if you were helped with the flood, if you were any way a part of the recovery, please come to the event. Right. Um, there is on-street parking. Um, there's some accessible spaces on street right near, um, right near the Legion. Mm -hmm. right. So I think it'll be fun. Thank you. Any questions? Awesome. Just saying the date out again. It's this Saturday, the 10th, from 6 to 9 at the Legion, and hope folks can make it. Um, and there will be a wall of paper plate awards. So, also, if there was someone who made a particular impact in your flood recovery or just being part of a community member, just know you'll have an opportunity to recognize them. Um, again, just the goal of recognizing like what the community has been through and that we're not done yet. There's still more to do, um, but also that 
having fun as part of being in it for the long term. So hope folks can make it. All right. Any other questions on that? <laughs> I was just going to try restarting it to see if that helped. Oh, I like it sort of quiet. I just <laughs> read I'm not the one that brought it down. Um, I thought there was the heat. It's low in the steam. Um, all right. Uh, no other questions on the uh, What the Flood update. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Entertainment Permit for Good Fire LLP. Do we have anyone representing Good Fire LLP? No. Okay. We did receive the application. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions, concerns, or would like to make a motion concerning this application? I have some concerns. Uh, okay. so, you know, Karen also has some concerns, so I'll make mine brief. Um, we're good fire since it's a very small property. Um, and my concern is with a live music event that they have not reached out to their neighbors. Uh, feels funny saying that as a former touring musician. But I will say it nonetheless, mm -hmm. if you're going to have an event outside, you should probably do the courtesy of reaching out to your neighbors, which is a question I would have asked someone if they had shown mm -hmm. up. And uh, I didn't see much of a parking plan. Uh, this is, uh, they don't have uh, extensive parking uh, there in Waterbury Center. Uh, I don't know how many people uh, they expect to, uh, to get them. I guess I still have more questions than answers. Uh, Karen? It also happens to be the weekend of the eclipse. Oh, oh perfect. <laughs> we'll have some extra people here. That's the point. Yeah, like getting about expectations uh, no, I don't think so. Well, I also don't know that our um, I don't know that our application asks them for that specifically. For what? Sorry. Expectations of crowds. Oh, right. um, my concern living on that street is that it is a small parking lot. Um, and so with the Cold Hollow Center Mill right across the street, you do tend to get a lot of people crossing back and forth across Route 100. Um, they mentioned in an email to me that they were going to reach out to neighbors about overflow parking, but they didn't send me any information that actually speaks to them doing that. Um, it says they're going to have their employees park off-site, but it doesn't say where. <laughs> so yeah. They say that no traffic uh, or parking impacts are anticipated. Uh, Whereas uh, we've seen on uh, any busy weekend, uh, you can anticipate uh, a traffic impact uh, on Route 100. Uh, and it can be dealt with uh, if you're willing to hire uh, a sheriff to uh, direct traffic and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, I'm not seeing any of that in this application. Yes, Mike. They did also mention that no alcohol or can cannabis will be sold or consumed outside. They didn't say anything about inside, and I don't know what there's. There's state laws prohibiting. I would assume there's laws for dispensaries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure about that. I don't mm -hmm. know if a cannabis place. How does one know? Thank you. I guess they don't do anything about themselves. Yeah. Any other concerns? Yes, Dan. Um, I mean, I think in general, I think that a lot of easily conflated what ifs. Um, I don't think that it's in general from 1130 to 5 without, you know, alcohol is going to be a huge deal, but I personally would rather ask them some questions and have some backup in mind. So curious about like, um, you know, we're able two full months away and what the deadline might be and if we could request that they come to the next meeting before being approved. Mm -hmm. So I can make a motion to that effect. Um, like a, a conditional approval, or? A, or uh, I don't think we need to do a conditional approval yet. I, I would make a motion that, that the staff from Vermont Good Fire Cannabis uh, attend the next select board meeting to answer some future questions. Because I know Garrett 
in our thing, she said a Zoom link would be available to them so they could have gotten on Zoom if they couldn't attend. <coughs> Do you need a motion for that? We have a motion. Yeah. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yeah. I just think for the future we need to think about what information we ask a permit applicant to apply and if we're applying at center. So I'm not saying that we're not bringing up relevant information, but I guess I would say if I was a lay person off the street filling this application out, I wouldn't know that I needed to provide this. And just to flag for mm -hmm. us, it's akin to the parade conversation. I know it says you have to follow all pieces of the ordinance and then you have to pull out the ordinance and cross-reference have I addressed it and just go ahead Karen yes Th this is attached to the ordinance so while I didn't print it it does have a, a pretty specific list of obligations that they have to fill um, they brought this to me last year just like one piece of paper and I wrote back and said no 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 you have to gather all this information yeah um, so in my opinion it's not complete based on the correspondence I had with them asking, for example, for a parking plan. Totally, and but I guess I'm just having not filled it out yet because you hadn't had that piece. I just didn't know if we listed all those requirements mm -hmm. out for folks so it was super clear. Um, again, I'm gonna support the motion. I think we should get more information mm -hmm. so it's a follow-up. Um, I just think so that ideally we're not in this situation in the future again. My goal is how do we get you a complete application up front that has all the information we need to make a decision in one go versus having to iterate. I sure. feel it's like for because we don't memorize it and it's going to be new people in a few months so that it's consistent for us to be able to look at and make decisions based on I think I would agree <clears throat> on working towards that. And kind of Alyssa in response I would hate to make these entertainment per permits too complex because good applicants you know, we're pretty straightforward. This is probably what it's going to be. It's, I think that's why it's, it's an applicant's, you know, responsibility to either show up here or go on Zoom so we can ask questions, you know. I don't think, you know, you want to make a 10-page application for so, something that could be very mundane. I don't think anyone's proposing 10 pages, but a checklist I'm, I'm like this would, would be super helpful for right. standardizing. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We'll be asking them to come back on the uh, 19th to uh, provide further answers. And perhaps they can do that in the meantime. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is revitalizing water. Karen. I would like to bring up my entire staff, if that's okay. Please do. I yes. want you to meet them. Meet them. Meet them all. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. Glad you had three seats. <laughs> so um, I just want to introduce uh, the, the people of Revitalizing Waterbury. You are? Dennis Palak. I'm the marketing associate. And I'm Owen Sebi-Bikati. I'm the economic development director. And you know me as Karen, the executive director. And Roger, you invited me, us to be here. Um, I can speak on all sorts of things, or if mm -hmm. there's a certain direction you would like me to talk about. Um, I understood from Tom that our financial request was not necessary to discuss, but if you want me to discuss that, we can. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we looked at it as not being uh, particularly controversial, right. uh, so that uh, you can I invite you to sort of hit the highlights, uh, but also we'd like to hear more about uh, the upcoming agenda for RW. Yes, and that's exactly what I want to talk about. So um, RW, I think you're aware of, has a number of different um, things we focus on, business support and economic development, and we have uh, economic development director, which you support in a really significant way, uh, and so Owen's work uh, is for the entire town of Waterbury. We also market and promote our town with Dennis doing social media and um, also all sorts of kind of um, promotions and, and communications. We also take care of what the town looks like, the design committee, the, flop, the uh, beautiful garlands and uh, all of those kind of pieces. We work with Mike Lociavo and the town to help work on that. Um, and we just do whatever else comes up. And one of the things I brought for you is our strategic plan. I thought you might like to see year two of the strategic plan. So I'm gonna hand it out. You can look at it at your own leisure. Um, but uh, 
It is, let me keep one for me. Um, something we've, we, we do annually um, is update our strategic plan and we focus on business support, we focus on marketing and promotion, we focus on what we call our community, the design, what it looks like, but also accessibility and inclusivity, that's really important. Um, we are very focused this year on communications as a tool that we need to uh, improve on, and then just our W organization. Um, what I'd like to do is have Owen and Dennis just speak very briefly on some of the projects they're working on this coming year. Owen? Yeah, so um, I've been in this position for two months and two weeks now, I believe. <laughs> um, I recently finished up the downtown reinvestment statistics reporting, which is required for us to maintain our designated downtown accreditation. Um, that went pretty successfully at like a 50% uh, response rate-ish. Um, is estimated roughly a million in um, rehabilitation by businesses in the downtown, and then a little over 250k uh, in facade improvements. Um, and then we've had net gains in workforce on both full-time and part-time employees. Um, so that was good, and glad I got that done. And the other main thing I'd say I'm working on, or a couple other ones, are updating our economic development strategic plan as it's fairly um, messy at the moment. Um, so I'm doing a complete rewrite on that. And then I am talking to roughly four organizations about commercial properties at the moment. Um, so that has some legs in a few areas of the town. And that's not just downtown. And it's very exciting. Yeah. So your economic uh, development strategic plan is not part of this document? No, the EDSP actually, if you, it, you will find it on um, goal 1.5, review work, uh, update the economic development strategic plan and um, bring it to the, w, um, the town to accept. So it is mm -hmm. one of our high priorities listed for this year. Okay. Um, other things we, you know, there's a variety of things, but there's also some key things we want to focus on. Uh, business mixers, we ke are keeping those going on. Uh, some programs around workshops. <coughs> we have a desire with this conversation around the armory. We've had a request last year for some um, workshops around uh, de-escalation of people and in, in businesses, business really, you know, when it happens when there's people in the store. So we're trying to pull that workshop together right now. Mm -hmm. and, and when should we expect the uh, economic development? Uh, I would say I'm trying to have a draft for the uh, WADC in our March meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So March time frame roughly. Right. So I, I would say you'd see it, You'll we'll get it to you second quarter. Okay. For sure. Let us get it all tidied up and then we'll get it to you guys. So I think that's our, our game plan. I did end up having to scrap the entire thing. I just do a full rewrite, so. Fair enough. Yeah. No. That's why we hired him. I told him to take, take ownership of this document. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Dennis, what are you working on? Yeah. Um, the reprint of the Discover Waterbury Guides. Um, seeing as though the last time this was updated was two years ago, there's been a lot of new businesses come into town and so it's pretty important to get that updated um, and my job being to promote and enhance and just communicate with everyone this is really big um, as is social media um, there's a lot of eyes on there now and so being able to continue to create a presence and a voice um, has been crucial yeah. And some of our social media is really trying to focus on our businesses in town and not just the standard ones. We love Stowe Street Emporium, but they have a lot of um, visibility, so let's get the small businesses that aren't being seen as much. Yeah, and we had a Discover Waterbury account, which was mainly for tourists. Now there's a revitalizing Waterbury account, which is strictly for local businesses and communicating with the people in town versus out of town and in town being mixed, which sometimes can get confusing to some. Mm -hmm. So, right. 
So a couple other projects. Um, the eclipse is coming. We all know that. Um, and one of the things that we are all working on is, um, and we're working really partnering with Katerina um, in and the town on how to make sure we have a safe and pleasant experience during the eclipse. Um, and I know you remember that wonderful day when I brought in the glasses. <laughs> um, and I just I. You can be the very first people to see this because it hasn't even gone out yet. Um, we are we've uh, created a flyer, Eclipse 2024 prep, lights out or business as usual. So this is going to be communications that we'll be getting out this week to our uh, our businesses in the area um, on things to consider, like. Maybe you're not open on Monday as a restaurant, but be open on Monday as a restaurant. Um, maybe you're only open at dinner. <laughs> Serve lunch. Uh, think about where your uh, employees are going to park because they may not be able to get out when they leave. So there's a lot of really good questions on here. And um, this is a big piece of about the eclipse is um, our concern is just educating the businesses. We still bump into people who go, oh, I don't have to care about that. And we go, well, you may not be able to get into your store. And then they, their eyes, they go, bing, 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 bing. Oh, what if I bought more inventory and opened my store up early that day? Ta-da. So they're beginning to think about these things. So we're very focused on the eclipse um, and really <coughs> appreciate the partnership we have with Katerina to make sure that works out well. Great. Um, uh, I had just one question on that one. Um, the previous uh, agenda item was on Good Fires uh, mm -hmm. Entertainment. Uh, they're planning yep. uh, outdoor live music event uh, from 11 till 5 uh, or yep. so on that Saturday. Um, is that part, does that figure into your planning at all? Or are they part of your? So group? it's a good question. So right here it says the stays range from Friday, April 5th to Tuesday, April 9th, with most festivities or activities starting on Saturday. So we, I did an inventory of the um, of the uh, lodging, and we're between 50 and 70 percent booked right now. Okay. Fairfield is 100 percent booked. Most of the small inns are 100 percent booked. Best Western is 50 percent booked. She fully expects to be fully booked by then. Um, it's been nice. Krista um, Bowdish actually experienced the eclipse in Tennessee, and so she and. Lynette from Good Fire as part of our team on business communication and to help develop this communication. One of the things we've asked people to do is if you create events, let us know and Dennis can start promoting the events. Um, so we, I knew about her event. She, it happens to be her anniversary, so they didn't even think about the eclipse when they started planning, but now they know it's also the eclipse day. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, Pieces, I think, you know, Tom, we've talked to Tom about it, and there's some conversation that we'll just have game day decisions or a couple days before decisions based on um, thinking about parking and all, all these other components. Uh, we have a meeting, huh, now I'm just thinking about that. Eric Pembroke from the Buildings and General Services did not respond to set up that meeting this week uh, with his deputy commissioner and the state to talk about the, um, the parking lots. Uh, we're really trying to encourage them. Uh, we already know Make that a, the state complex state parking complex. lots uh, yeah. accessible. We already know that Pilgrim <coughs> Park businesses plan on doing business as usual and not allowing people, you know, not doing anything with the parking, and we think they'll get caught off guard in a significant mm -hmm. way. Indy, you will of Vermont. What's well, that uh, parking lot on Railroad Street uh, that's uh, on the rail route, mm -hmm. rail track side yep. of the street? That is owned by Wayne Lamberton. It is a private parking lot for the thing, but it's mostly public. People park when they want to. Mm -hmm. We're working on it. <coughs> all okay. part of the stuff we're working on. I don't have answers uh, for it all. Uh, <laughs> and the state lot is public parking, of course, but we'd like to encourage them to be remote that day so right. there's more public parking. Mm -hmm. And just to get their official blessing to, to use it, maybe manage it if we need to. Right. And then, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you try to book a hotel in Waterbury now, you cannot book it for the day before. You've got to book it for that. Oh, you have to buy it for at days. least two. Yeah. You have to get two days. Mm -hmm. And for Krista, she has people checking out and checking in on Monday. 
And anyone checking out, she's given permission to leave their cars there so they can stay through the eclipse and then leave. Melissa Moore <coughs> requires people to stay overnight on Monday night to Tuesday. Now they can leave on Monday, but she's, they're paying for their parking spot and a room for that night. So everyone's, you know, and I think, I don't know what the prices are, but I don't know, I'm pitching a tent in my yard, so, <laughs> for my family. Um, and, and just one other point, um, mm -hmm. any weekend in early October, we can anticipate that uh, Route 100 is going to be chocker block between exit 10 and yeah. center. So, uh, and we did receive some complaints about the traffic backup and lack of traffic control uh, in Waterbury Center. Um, so I'm wondering well, if you have any concerns. <coughs> I know it's part of our conversation. Here's the problem. You've got only so many sheriffs to spread around the entire state, northern part of Vermont. I mean, there's only so many people to do the work. I think the bigger piece is messaging and letting locals know that it's a, it's a bad day to go and get milk and eggs at the store. Mm -hmm. Just do that all the night before. And I know a lot of people who aren't even sending their kids to school that day. They're just not. On that one day. I think <coughs> the half day is a bad idea. I think it should be. Okay, but. <laughs> they should just not go, and I know a lot of people are just not going to send their kids to school because they can't, won't be able to get to them. So I, I have some significant concerns about the, the roads that day, especially for the folks who are working at the places that will be patronized <coughs> yeah. by tourists. If they can't get to work, we can't open those businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's actually addressed here. Oh, is it? That's one of the questions. It's really right on what impact of your employees. Where will they park? How will they get in? How will they leave? If possible, have your employees work remotely, or we also have suggested somewhere to, um, to we talked about creating an off-site town parking lot where people can put their employees and then walk into town. So that's a good that's a good tip. I hadn't thought about that. Really yeah, it's that's just one of the many ones, and these came from a great conversation that Owen and I had with Krista and Lynette as they were brainstorming these ideas. Another really cool idea is to create, um, I'm going off topic, I'm going down the eclipse um, rabbit hole, which is really easy to do, but I'm just gonna finish. Another thought they suggested was making Randall and Elm a pedestrian street and railroad and union a pedestrian street so that people who are parked in the exterior areas can walk easily into town without having to do a way so It's just an idea. Katarina and I are working, and we'll see how it goes. So, um, I do want to talk about um, one other main thing, that a big thing that we're really focused on this year, and that is mentioning Route 100. Um, we, back in the day, we were a downtown organization only caring about the downtown. That changed in 2016, so that's about eight years ago. And since then, we've been wanting to focus up Route 100. Um, the reason it changed is we hired an economic development director by the town, and the town wanted, you know, was, we're not going to have the economic development director only restrict his, uh, um, his area of, of focus. So the entire town became part of revitalizing Waterbury's concern. Since then, we've been trying to focus on Route 100, prior providing business support and other um, activities. And things like Main Street reconstruction and the pandemic kept us sort of focused here. Starting in 2024, um, we really are going to try to create some <coughs> real good plans, programming, talking to the businesses. What can they? What do they want from us? Every one of our committees are thinking about this. Marketing and promotion is thinking about it. The design committee is thinking about extending garlands up Route 100. Economic development. You know, working. So it's really this all-encompassing goal this year of thinking about um, how to support those businesses so that they feel like they're as much part of us, uh, us being the town of Waterbury, not just revitalizing Waterbury. So that's one of our big focus. I mean, there's plenty of other things. Take a look. <coughs> um, yeah. Questions? Yeah, come on up. Hi, I'm Janelle Gulwer here. I just a couple of questions, and it may be a town issue versus uh, revising on Waterbury. Um, trash receptacles, cleanup following, overnight parking with people, people maybe coming in with campers or cars. Um, you know, if, if we don't have a good plan of 
clean up after or policing uh, while this is going on. I mean, people could be parking in front of people's houses and camping overnight and all over the place. So, so I can answer a few of yep. those. Cool. I, don't, I don't know the answer offhand about trash. I do know we've ordered a ton of porta potties. I forget the exact number. 30, 20. 20. And we've been told that's not enough, but that's what we get. <laughs> um, yeah. And part of our internal conversation has been to people that if you live on the main drags and, and you can let people park in your driveway to go ahead and sure. charge them 20 bucks if you can do that. We've talked about Dak Row, but it could be a mud pit in April 6th and we're not going to ruin the fields for it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, all those things will be challenges. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll try to figure out the garbage piece. I think you're right, we're going to need to make a little more investment there. Yeah, I, I, if you've all, and I'm sure many of you have been to a huge venue where you've, not many, this many people, but you know what it looks like sometimes when everybody's a left. Um, I get, think it's quite messy. Um, some of the areas I was concerned about, back side of the river, I mean, that's a lot more Duxbury, but you have Winooski Street down there on <coughs> the bridge, the underpass on Stowe Street. I mean, Mr. Lamberton owns that private land there, but that's not going to stop people from just kind of hasn't yet from camping there. So just kind of wanted to bring that up as I a concern. I think the goal for revitalizing Waterbury, it's all about messaging. We're just making sure we get, it's not, we cannot be responsible for nope. the whole eclipse experience, but mm -hmm. our goal is to make sure that we have, we, and we have, we've asked these questions, okay. public safety, parking, education of the community, education of the businesses, promotion and events, really <coughs> I mean, these meetings have been going on for months, <laughs> and um, we, uh, we're we just making sure the questions arise and we figure out how to solve them. Perfect. Yeah, that's all I wanted to yep. do is make sure there's some discussion on those points. It's Thank on you. there. Yeah. Other questions? Anything else you want to address, Kim? Thank you for your support, as always. Um, we, we appreciate it. Uh, I think Revitalizing Waterbury has been around for 30 plus years. Um, it's, uh, we're strong and healthy and I uh, feel that we do a lot. Um, actually, I'll tell you one last little nugget. Um, in the communications world and the world of volunteers, I love your volunteer appreciation event. We will be planning um, later, probably late spring, um, what we're calling a volunteer mixer. And we're going to connect with all of the nonprofits in town and invite them to do. It could also be called a volunteer um, uh, fair where all uh, the different nonprofits can set up tables. We'll invite anybody who's interested in finding out how better to get involved. So it's not just come and sign up for an RW committee, but sign up for. Vermont Hots, <laughs> or um, the dog park, or Water <coughs> Reservoir, or the library. So we're really planning this event. It was done up in Stowe, and they, it was highly successful with over 150 people showing up. So we're really looking to um, uh, obviously increase the uh, volunteerism with Revitalizing Waterbury, but actually for all the communities. And people have been asking, how do I get involved? And so we've decided to create this kind of community-wide event. Um, we're very excited about it. This town's full of volunteers. You guys know it. Um, yeah. But there are also a lot of people who just don't know how to get involved. So we're going to figure out how to do that. So. Chris. Yeah, Karen, uh, do you expect this, this event's going to be kind of overwhelming regardless of the weather? Are you talking about the Eclipse? Yeah. Yes. So, I'm going to say maybe there's a fundraising opportunity there where you could create two fictitious teams. <laughs> Clear blue sky or rain like hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's all. You know, maybe, winter takes maybe, all. Maybe we could take that. <laughs> right. 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 Um, but it's it also, hmm? It already be here. <laughs> 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 really you know, What's the chances of that? Right, but the other, the other thing is that it's going to be it's still going to be dark. Yeah. Because the sun does go behind. So even for three and a half, two and a half to three minutes, it's still going to be dark. Mm -hmm. So that experience, you know, we may not have the eye damage, though I still wear my glasses. Um, but yes, I think people are coming. Regardless. Regardless. And 
we're projecting 10,000 for the town of Waterbury. Um, we project that, and I remember telling you guys this, <laughs> partly because we're on 89. <coughs> if you get in Boston and you start driving, you can stop in Montpelier and come to Waterbury. You know, yes, you can get off, then you can get off the interstate and try to go up for 100, but then you're starting to get into crowds. Why go any further than Montpelier or Waterbury? Mm -hmm. So. And I kept getting oh. numbers from the state tourism department about how many people, and I, mm -hmm. I kept struggling to get context, and finally the context I got was the numbers projected to come to Vermont are roughly double peak week peeper weekend. Mm -hmm. but on so, one day. Well, that's a lot. So on one day. By one, on, yeah. But and the other piece is, at the, same time. the opportunity <laughs> that I, <laughs> the opportunity I see for the eclipse is that people are going to arrive on Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. They have nothing to do but come eat in our restaurants and shop in our stores because it's April. They're not going to go hiking mountain, you know, camels <coughs> hump. They're not going to go kayaking on the reservoir. They're going to be in town. That's our window of opportunity, and that's the message to the businesses: make sure you're open. Make sure you figure that out. That won't be as crowded as Monday. <coughs> Still, that's our window of opportunity. Mike, you have a yeah. Yeah. Karen, you know I know, but could you update the rest of the uh, select board on the um, alley project? Oh, here? yes. There's so many things to talk about. I forget to get <laughs> them all. Um, very exciting. Uh, the alley project is moving forward. Uh, we, ha we ran into some um, bumps last fall um, that we are uh, working out, but our goal is to break ground um, mid to late April. Um, I would say May 1st would probably be the latest. Um, After but the don't. <laughs> what was that? After the 8th. After the 8th. <laughs> Absolutely, after the 8th. Um, and uh, we have a sculpture, entrance sculpture, that will be going to the DRB in March for its final approvals. Our, we have lots of people currently um, choosing lighting designs. We have people. Uh, working on um, choosing planters and benches. Uh, there is more fundraising. There's going to be a very large fundraising campaign that will be launched right in the beginning of April, um, connected to the Better Places program at the state. You give me 100, they'll give me 200, that equals 300. So um, it's a two to one match, and the goal for us to raise 20,000, and we'll bring in another 40, that's 60,000. Project probably needs to, we would need to raise about 80-ish thousand dollars left, so that would take um, a good chunk of it. Your gift to this project is, was significant, and we really appreciate it. Um, we have just launched a new communications campaign. You'll start seeing it on social media and other ways. So from today, moving forward, I think it's Every Monday? Every Monday. Yeah. Every Monday there'll be social media posts about the project as we build. Um, right. Yeah, Mike is on our fundraising committee and has um, been very involved. So. Julie, did you have your hand up? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're very excited. Yeah. Can't believe we're getting there. All right, any more questions? Thank you so much. We Thank you for letting it. us Thank come you. and take up your time. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda, we have the Planning Commission and Unified Bylaw Updates. Woo! Yeah! I'm so excited! Now we'll mess up. Well, I guess our job is done now. We, we hired Alyssa, cheerleading, we're done. So where are the rifles? Hmm? Uh, and do you want Neil to come up? Uh, we would love for Neil to come up. Neil's here. Our buddy How are we going to get to the I'll be there. The projectors don't Um, so I, I can see you, and Roger can see you, but most of the board cannot. 
I mean, your camera's off anyway, but um, anyway, please chime in if uh, you need to. There you are. Hi, Dana. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Alan. Um, all right, and uh, do we have uh, representatives of the DRB here? Um, Harry's online. Harry's online. Okay, great. Sorry, who's? Oh, Harry. Harry. Harry Shepard. All right, uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind introducing uh, your commission and uh, then give us uh, the overview. And first of all, let me thank you uh, for the tremendous work that all of you have put in over the past year to get this to uh, the finish line. Thanks. I, I guess I'm going to ask, before I start going, you guys all have uh, this, because that's what we're going to sort of speak from? Yeah. All right. Um, with me, uh, my, na my name is Marcus Staskis. Uh, this is Mary Cohen, and uh, everybody knows Billy Victor. And on the <laughs> line, we have uh, Dana Allen, uh, who is attending remotely. Um, I, I guess I'd like to take a few seconds <coughs> to just demonstrate the talent that you have on your planning commission. Mary's got the historical knowledge to bring in um, a lot of the process that has gone on before I was there. Um, Dana brings um, a very nice uh, element of GIS mapping. So when we're talking about zoning districts, we really rely on Dana's expertise and um, suggestions and design to be able to present the information along that line. And then Billy has come to us with questions galore. <laughs> he asks more questions which which are keep us on our toes. I think that's really important to have us look at, you know, maybe something that we hadn't thought about before. Um, and then lastly, we do want to give a massively huge thank thank you to Neil. Neil has just made this whole process a, a completely different uh, operation experience. experience and quite frankly successful to this date. So thank you. thank you. So with that, thank you to the plan, uh, select board for having us here. Um, we, we're, what we're going to present here is an overview, but we really want to articulate what we think uh, would be important. This, this is a massive document and a massive effort, as everybody knows. And so we are very hopeful. Uh, we think it's extremely important for the select board to be participating in the public hearing process if you're at all able to come to one or both. Um, and because it's going to come to you eventually <coughs> once we get through uh, making a record, as our recommendation of the, of the product is to you. So uh, what we have here tonight is we just want to highlight the goals of why we're doing this the tools that are available for you to look at and review to sort of stream down some of this uh, amount of the data. Um, and then um, we, the other thing that is in this document specifically is the, is the purpose statements for each zoning district. So we have spent some time, we really sort of, we, we work from the goals and then we go to the purpose statements and spend some time looking at, you know, what is each zoning district, what's the goal of that zoning district? And with that, then we can come to the uses, that, whether it's permitted, conditional, be based upon what's the purpose of that zoning district. So in this document, we've given you, we pulled those out of the whole UBD bylaw phase one document itself. So you have them handy and easily uh, accessible. Um, I'm not going to read this. You can read it yourself. And we want to be brief. We want to actually open it up to your questions. So, again, we have been on a, while we're looking at the document and trying to make it applicable to the town, we've been on a huge uh, information intake. We've, you know, SE Group as our outreach coordinator, thank you for granting the funds to get them to help us. Um, we have put out some information and we've been listening and taking it in. Um, it is a live document. So the materials that are on the website are what was, and storyboards, and Dana's gonna talk about the slider map. 
what is on is what was prepared back in the fall when we first worked with SE Group, and we've continued to take information in. Not all of it is in, is, how do I say this, publicly posted? How should I, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. right? Okay, so we have, we, if you see something that's not what you thought, just check with Neil or one of us, because it's probably in the live document that's not posted at the moment. Okay. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is this is an iterative process and until we get to the document that we present to you, we won't be done taking information and making, I mean, the public hearing is for hearing the public. So we expect to hear something that we may need to go back and tweak some one way or another. All right. Um, I'm going to be brief. Mary, you or Billy, do you want to add anything? Uh, Dana, do you want to add anything or comment on the map itself or wait for questions? Um, if you want me to address the, the map, um, I'm happy to or answer questions on it. Um, What's the select your board pleasure? pleasure? Um, I'd be interested in hearing what have been key points of controversy within your group or uh, what you've heard when you have done the interactive uh, meetings uh, with the SE group uh, and how have you addressed those? I, go ahead. Can I jump in? Uh, one of the things that we, the map we started with uh, took more blocks of the town. We tried, we, we made a point, the current map doesn't necessarily, the boundaries of the districts don't align with property lines, so we tried to do that. But we, we came to this in the last year with sort of some um, chunks of this part yeah. of town that would be mixed use or neighborhood or um, conservation. And we've refined that based upon the input. So, yeah. and so I think the map you have in front of you is, is um, correct me if I'm wrong, data is, is updated to the, to today, you know, sort of what boundaries we see, what parts of town, but um, it's changed quite a bit based upon public input from where we started, I'd say, a year ago. Yeah, if I could, if I can address that too, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's controversy, but we did receive feedback during our information sessions about certain areas of town. Um, you know, in particular with respect to mixed use or neighborhood, two of our new zoning districts. And so actually in the past, uh, the map that you're seeing right now, we've actually changed a significant portion of town, notably around the school, to neighborhood designation from where it had been as mixed use. So if you go to the slider map on SE Group's information website and some of those storyboards, you'll see that that area around the school used to be mixed use. Mm -hmm. um, We've significantly revised that in this most updated version. I don't know if we'll be able to get SE Group to revise that slider map. Um, I'm not sure that we still have uh, bandwidth in the contract with that. We, have a, we need to talk to them about that. Um, but our mapping will reflect that. And so that's a big thing that came out of this. Um, another thing that you'll notice um, in this is that the downtown district has been expanded um, to the railroad bridge that came out of public comments. Um, and then finally, I think something that is different and it's, you know, maybe not as obvious from the slider map, but the downtown design review district, um, we actually expanded that to encompass all of the downtown districts, mixed use along Main Street, the campus area, which is primarily the state complex. Um, and we extended that design review district into the mixed use areas that are northwest of the roundabout. Um, you know, and that was in response to some of the concerns that we'd heard from the public, um, some of the sentiment that we received there, and as well as, you know, some of the DRB's desires, I think. Um, so that, those are some changes that we've made that I wouldn't really necessarily say are controversial. They're just relatively large changes. And that did come out of the information sessions. Those weren't public hearings to be clear, but they did come out of that process. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, we 
good, good to point out. We've also added, uh, and this is to our concerns over the floods, <laughs> uh, we've added a district called Conservation Flood Plain. And it, at the moment, is made up of primarily, if not all, I think there's one that might not be. One might be a private property, but the others are utility properties, railroad properties, public <coughs> properties. So they're not um, destined, really, for a lot of other development anyway. And they're uh, primarily along the river. Uh, so we're saying nothing. No permitted uses. Um, and so that's new for sure, specifically to that um, situation. The other, um, to your question, Roger, I, I would say obviously with the housing conversations that are going on statewide, quite frankly, um, we've done a lot of work, a lot of work on density, lock coverage, setbacks, those details in terms of trying to create infill opportunities um, in, in the phase one area particularly. So we know there's phase two, and so when we're talking about a zoning district that we know is in phase two, we have to be extra careful about you know, jumping too far. Um, so we're trying to balance that, and we'll see where it will end up in the end game. Mm -hmm. I think we also heard some grumblings about height. And well, so, that's the other part. Yeah. And adapt. So, if you want to address it, go ahead. But. No, no, no. I mean, it's the it's the numbers. Okay, the numbers, the density, right. the lot coverage, um, lot size, um, height. So, in downtown, we've got 60 feet now because that's consistent with the interim um, the by, the interim yeah. bylaws that were passed. But I fully expect a bunch of people to ask what what we were doing with I 60 don't. feet. <laughs> anyway, it's the numbers is what I think you should focus on. So in the document there, and we, this, we should point this out too, in the document um, there is an appendix. We've taken the dimensional uses, the use, the use table, the dimensional table, what did I say, dimensional standards table, um, and the dimensional definitions are all in the appendix. And we would ask you, look at that not there's underneath it we're waiting for se group to finish these what we call the gray tables up in the front of the document and those Six, are not 1605 not necessarily current. that's the that's so. the zoning outline excuse me that outlines the zoning districts and the purpose statements are there but then there's right don't look at the tables gray below that <laughs> they're not accurate yet so go to find this if you if you say oh i live in mixed use what's going to be allowed Go to the appendix, not yeah. to the I know that, that our fire chief uh, expressed some concern about uh, heights of buildings. I don't know exactly where his cutoff is. Uh, four stories. Four stories? Yeah. Four stories. What is but he defined as four, four stories? Four stories. <laughs> like, translated into feet. Welcome to our <laughs> world. <laughs> yeah. um, because higher than that, sure. we would have to buy new equipment. Very expensive. Sure. And then marry that to uh, Act 47 or S100 that if it's um, low moderate income housing, they get a bonus of putting on another story. You see, we're so we're trying to actually stay away from stories and just talk about feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A visual that's helpful is the, on the SE group materials. They put these visuals together to yep. show you when you when I look at the dimensional tables, my eyes just kind of span I, with no background. But they've done some nice depictions, and it's on the website, and it's pretty close. Well, I mean, their link be... is in this document, too. Oh, right. And so that's a good place to get a visual if you're a visual, yeah. not a number person. But can you say something more about the campus district? Because I know the campus district is the you know state complex, but at some point in time, we never know. This... Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so I, the goal of the, I think I can address that. Okay. So the goal of the campus is so we sort of feel like there's a future. We want yeah, to plan for the future. Yeah, I think there is, but you never know. Right. So what we did was um, it was important to the commission <coughs> to uh, maintain that character, that open uh, horseshoe, for example. And so in the document, you'll see that we looked at lot coverage, keeping lot coverage to 60%. And that way, there's a limit to what can be developed, all right? Because the structures right. already take up some. 
The other thing that we see as a potential future opportunity is multifamily housing. <coughs> so the campus district has some low impact, I'll call it my word, um, other uses, but we want to- Business incubators, that type. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, right. okay, but um, not, you know, a, a Walmart. Uh, we're, right. we're trying to stay away from that, but we want to try to maintain that character. We recognize that that's like a, uh, an important feature in the town. Mm -hmm. So again, look at the use table in the back and look at the purpose statement. And I think that that will give you a good idea of where we're, where our thinking was. We never know if that, that district could, you know, Absolutely. Right. could no. change. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, my question is, um, did the campus, so the campus district is new. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, there was, so, there is currently a campus overlay, overlay. overlay. so this Got replaces it. the overlay um, and makes it clear you. that we're talking, it's not an overlay, it's the description of the district. Got it. So I guess I will more point my question toward commercial industrial. Did it formally, in our current zoning plans, does it include multifamily housing no. and commercial and industrial? No. Not now. We're Please. proposing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the addition. I really like. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that addition. I think I think one of the I think one of the things that will be most helpful is to look at the use table in the appendix and carefully look at what are the uh, uses that are pro being proposed based upon the purpose statement of the district. If you have the purpose statement and the use table, you'll start to pretty quickly see where we were at, and then. The next step is looking at the uh, dimensional table to see how you are achieving adding those things or adjusting them or modifying them. Tom? Um, we had a conversation at some point about the design review district and modifying that to include a portion of the campus. Is that done as part of these bylaws or is that a separate It's process? not done at the moment. We just, our meeting tonight was to go through the criteria. Our goal is to include the design overlay we're calling it the design overlay not the downtown because mm -hmm. it's downtown and mixed use and, and campus and campus excuse me um and we're going through the criteria for that right now okay and the outline of that is accurate oh, data yeah. put that on the map as well so it's outlined in the red and in the yellow is where the new design review district would be yeah although we You'll see in the key the current downtown design review has yeah. two sub districts. G That's what are, just said. Yeah, but just yeah. just to point out, we're not going to do two sub districts. Yeah, make it one. There has been one. Of, you know, I think that's a good point. And Mary's saying that has been one of our goals here is to streamline things a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a pretty massive document, but we we have a few fewer districts, <laughs> um, but we're trying to cover what's the purpose of those districts. Mm -hmm. so. One and the other way that besides increasing housing density by the dimensional standards of a building or a, um, a lot, we, we're also taking away the prohibitions on only one dwelling unit and an mm -hmm. ADU on a property or, you know, those kind of things. So that in, the, in focusing less on the use of a building and more of the, um, <laughs> having that combined with the dimensional standards and the purpose of the district. We've also promoted uh, uh, housing along uh, on Route 2 in our residential one area, so we're hoping there'll be some impetus to put some housing out there. Whether it happens or not, I don't know, but we've at least made that To the west available. of town or where? That's to the west of yeah, town. To the west. Yep. But until you get, I mean, a lot of it's in floodplain, so people are going to, you know, but. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like far field. <coughs> yeah, underwater housing. <laughs> <laughs> House folks. Exactly. All right. Uh, anyone else on the board have questions? Uh, yeah, Melissa. Thank you. Oh, I was just, I mean, mine was also wrap up. I was going to say thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I wanted to ask, uh, unless you want to go now, I was going to ask uh, the DRB, uh, Harry Shepard, uh, if he had any particular questions. Harry?
Hi, good evening. I don't really have any questions. I know a few of us met with the Planning Commission a few weeks back, and I was kind of tuning in here this evening to just try to hear the progress. So uh, uh, I did hear uh, one thing that encouraged me a little bit is that there's uh, some changes to the to the zoning lines, particularly the mixed use stuff. And uh, one of the things that uh, we were hoping for is uh, possibly creating more opportunities for housing uh, along North Main Street and the northwest side of the roundabout. Um, and uh, sounds like uh, the Planning Commission heard some of that and have made some of those changes. So that I think is positive. The DRB was really helpful to have come um, and give their, I mean, they're living it. Right, I've, right. I've they're been, the ones that are making the calls <coughs> on I mean. the regs in front of them. Yeah, I spent 10 years on the DRB around that, and I know you, you sit there and you try to step yourself through the regulations. So um, where we can be more specific, where we can get rid of uh, adjectives that are not helpful or definitive, you know, we've tried to do that as well. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, and Alyssa. Can you just outline the timeline in terms of the steps? Oh, sure. Good question. So our and so you can all get it on your calendar. Uh -huh. Our public hearings are February twentieth and March fourteenth. Oh. Um, and then uh, we hope to. I don't have the timeline. You have the time. I sent the timeline previously. It hasn't changed much. We've had to move the public hearings a little bit. Uh, a little bit later, but our goal is still the end game is to get it to you folks April, right? Is it in April? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the deadline, but March. Yeah. As soon as March we can, after March 14th, after right. March 14th on, we'll yeah. have to take a little bit of input and clean up some things, and then we're going to get it to you as soon as possible. Okay. And then follow up on that, I guess, is just to say, can you describe, or Neil, or I can try my best, of where folks watching at home can find this info. Personally, I go to the Planning Commission page on the Water Right VT website, and then you have the Unified Development Bylaw Phase 1 in the sidebar. Yeah, and yes. I've been able to find the link to SC Group there, but is there a better route I should be going now? No, that's it, that's and that's why I put the links. These are live links in your document, right. so you can just click on it, because I have the same problem, <laughs> quite honestly. But, but the, as Data was saying, the SC Group materials are really from the fall, so right. those are not the definitive. Right. It's just some visuals, like Billy said, and things like that that you might Well, and the storyboards is are clicked. Um, you can click on there, and I still can't use. find those. Yeah. But um, they're not actually online. The storyboards from the old mixed use are Oh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. They're they're there. Anyway, the sure. links I checked. But we've changed mixed use different. a lot, I know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's why it's Mixed kind of use, you're going to want this map. You have the hard copy in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's your most valuable resource right now. Holy. And I guess I'm saying preemptively, kind of in defense of the public and everyone else, I want to make sure we get these up for public consumption ahead of your hearing. As too, soon as possible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're it's trying. looking yeah. like a week before, yeah. which, you know, I wish it were a little bit earlier, but the, they're busy too. And the first oh. public hearing might not be so people can come fully informed, but hopefully they will come to be informed. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. We're going to hear right. from the public. It's right. not, not for us to educate right. the public. Okay? But we may so, not have it all. I know, but I want to be clear. Yeah. We're not going to be there to educate the public. We, we're getting these resources out. We're getting communications out. And it's a public hearing. We're going to record their comments and take that in, take it back. What, what do we need to change or not change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, I think we appreciate the fact that we heard that story tonight, uh, you know, with you came, you put some work out, you heard some things, you made some changes, and it, it'll continue to be an iterative process through the two hearings coming forward. And, and I'd also like to reiterate what Martha said about if you can, come or tune in or watch later the public hearings, because you're going to have a public hearing, and you may get totally different people, but, you know, hopefully want to respond to just the number that are there, but have a fuller view of kind of what the community is saying. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dana.
Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have the Housing Task Force Objectives. Joe? Hey, Joe. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. So as I introduced myself two weeks ago, I'm Joe Camerata from the Housing Task Force. Uh, a little different topic this time, but I wanted to bring to you today was the objectives that we are considering setting in 2024 to get your feedback. And as I mentioned when I was here last time, the Housing Task Force was formed last year and started meeting regularly around May or so. So in the first five months, we just kind of dove in to a set of activities, if you, if you would, that we thought were important. And I kind of outlined those in the um, accomplishment document. So they were things like trying to look at what data we had. Most of the data that we were working off of before was pre-pandemic. Didn't necessarily reflect things like affordability, right? So we started to look at what data sources we could get, how we could update those. We did some extensive work with a document that was put out by Main Street America, which was called Housing Guide for Local Leaders. And that had a really interesting process of that. How do you go through what's called infill development, where you already have some infrastructure to be able to find vacancies for other things. So we start working our way through that document. We spent a whole meeting talking about the 51 South Main Street, and I put in the position statement that we drafted around, around that. And then, of course, we also did the recommendations for the short terms. <coughs> but as we moved into, um, moving into 2024, we wanted to be a little bit more strategic, if you would, in terms of what we were accomplishing. And we laid out three objectives. But before I dive into those objectives, are there any questions about 2023 and what we did? Just suck. So I'm glad I'm, I'm not alone here and failing to get the Zoom and Al to work right. Um, well, ironically, today it's the projector. <laughs> what about, at at uh, the meeting where I was not there, uh, recording the, in progress. Two weeks ago, uh, you presented a chart of what other towns have done vis a vis short term housing. Right. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you have any updates on that or any particular objective as regard to uh, short-term housing going forward. So no updates. I mean, it was up to date as we presented it two weeks ago. Okay. And it's a fluid situation as other towns, select boards, and planning commissions think they are doing that. Um, <clears throat> there is a, actually, there is the Vermont Short-Term Rental uh, Agency, BTR. STRA or something like that, right? The they association? Actually, the association, yeah. yeah. They actually do a fairly good job of giving an update as to what the towns are doing. So, you know, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. from them. Uh, but no, I mean, there's no update to that. And no, we really didn't put specific short-term rental objectives into this year, mm -hmm. into our objectives for this year. And was there a reason for that? Uh, because we felt, um, as we said last time, we felt that the short-term rentals weren't the primary cause. We wanted to try to get down to how do you really improve housing, housing capacity. We also felt that with the recommendation that a lot of the work that was going to have to go on because that was going to be handled by the town. Mm -hmm. But again, if there is a, if there's other thoughts on that or there's things that you're looking for from the um, task force, this is why we're here tonight. Okay, why don't we go through what your recommendations okay. are and we'll see if there's any other questions. Okay. So we set out three primary, rec uh, what I would call objectives. The goals are, I, I like to think of goals as being more a little amorphous, kind of high level, but objectives as being hopefully more concrete. But you can measure at the end of the year, did you do it, did you do it? Okay, so the first thing that we're looking at doing was trying to assess the potential for infill de development to address our housing needs. So we start looking at this a little bit, like what, how much housing do we think we're going to need in, in the next, say, five years, okay? And then how much of that do we believe we can get out of the out of infill development, <coughs> meaning development where we you know we already have infrastructure. And I think this is an important 
question to answer for the town because if we come back and we say, man, it's only going to be about 20% of your total housing needs, then you need to think about where you're going to get the other 80% of your housing needs. But if on the other hand we come back and we say we think there's enough infill development that will be the 80%, it changes a little bit of the calculus there, okay? So we have been looking, um, other towns have done these housing assessments. Uh, two that come to mind that I just read recently, Williston did one and Londonbury, Londonbury did one. We can pretty much copy the approach they use, um, but we'll try to use publicly, well, we will use publicly available data, that's all we have. We'll see how far we can get with being able to do that. But I outlined the three questions that we want to ask. How much housing will we need? Um, what will be the, the, the target, in, the median target incomes for that housing? And then how much of that supply can we get from infill development? Okay. It's the first objective. I have a, a question. Um, I think those are all very good questions. The first one I'm a little more concerned about because there are so many variables involved. We don't know if there's going to be a recession. We don't know, you know, in, infill, outfill. You know, there's so many variables to look at. So how do you really estimate what our need will be? I know it's just, it's, it's a tough issue. Yeah. So there's a couple of different ways. There's a really kind of gross high level way that the state talks about in terms of what are the expected vacancy rates for long-term rentals and for housing um, on the market. Right. And that's a really kind of back of the envelope calculation that we can do, we kind of already done, just to kind of say where, where, are, right. where are we, okay? That's not, but that doesn't account for more of the dynamics of who wants to be here that aren't here, um, what shifts are we going to see in, in, in population? The, the London Dairy Housing Assessment actually went a little bit more in detail into that. They actually start looking at certain subpopulations of, of people, like how many workers could be in town but aren't in town, and how many seniors could be looking to move that. So that's where we start to look at what was the approach that they used. Can we use the public data sources to begin to, for those populations, get a better get a better estimate. Because like if you look at five years ago, yeah, pre, pre pandemic, exactly. the pandemic changed everything. Yeah, it did. That's why I said I mean we, we might only be able to go a couple of years reliable. Right. Five years might be too much. You know? Yeah. I can also answer you a little bit. Vermont announced it's gonna be a couple of weeks ago now, the state did that or someone in the state announced that Vermont is going to need somewhere between forty and fifty thousand housing units total. Tell you for Waterbury, but that's what Vermont thinks it is. So we got to put somewhere in there. Well, I'm very aware of, of, of that study, and it just it, it is a projection, but it's based upon you know just normalized uh, growth growth models, and sometimes those growth models just aren't occurring. You know, we had a, a pandemic, but we don't know if we're going to see a spike in population. We don't know if we're going to see a Exodus of sure. for monitors because of taxation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. right. <coughs> Other questions for Joe on uh, objective one? Okay. So, objective two started to look a little bit more at the process of um, not just knowing the numbers, but kind of working through the mechanics, if you would, of what's it going to take in order to get that housing. Um, to happen. And we did some thinking about if it's infill development, how, what kind of opportunities do you have? And we kind of broke it down into three. You think about you know, a green field or, or a brownfield development. You know, you have a vacant lot or you have an old unused building. Um, you can think about reuse of an, of an existing building, an underlying, uh, underutilized building. And this is some of the, you know, coming back to looking at some of the things from the Main Street program about, you know, vacant space that might be on top of existing built, I mean, in, in existing buildings that could be reused. And then the, th the third area is you could have accessory dwelling units. And this actually is also very interesting given the new bylaws that we were just discussing coming into, into effect. So we wanted to start a, to if, work through some of those opportunities to understand what are the barriers. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about this. We have a lot of anecdotes about it, right? But until you actually roll up your sleeves and, and start to work through the process yourself, you're not going to really understand what the barriers are. And that's what we were hoping to do is to say, could we find the opportunities in each of those categories, start to work with the, 
with either a developer or property owner to go through that process, understand why it takes so long, why is this so costly, and then begin to um, make some recommendations on how to, as Margaret said earlier, how to streamline, how to streamline those processes. So that was the, the second objective. Um, one question on that is, uh, you know, Martha and uh, her team uh, is presenting us with uh, these proposed uh, changes to the zoning regs. Uh, does anything pop up uh, based on <coughs> what work you've done so far that would uh, be problematic? Or, or have you familiarized with yourself? No, about? nothing that I think would be problematic. I mean, we have attended the public sessions Mm -hmm. um, to understand them a little bit better. I do think the question, and this is, uh, Mary uh, um, sits on our, our task force, and we, asked, and we asked the question, did you estimate how much additional housing we could have? And they hadn't done that. Um, also, what would the process be? How are we going to educate people so that they understand the, the changes to the bylaws and mm -hmm. the opportunities, and then, how to go through that process themselves, right? So there are things where under that last category might really come into play once the bylaws are in effect to begin to say how do we start to stimulate some momentum around them. Mm -hmm. Other questions on uh, objective two? No? Okay. All right. And the last was just looking at, um, you know, working with some developers to understand the, the incentives. It kind of follows on from objective two once we understand the barriers and why things are so hard. We could talk about how to either make them easier or you know, financially how do, how do we create some incentives for people to come in and, and develop here. Uh, um, have you seen examples of objectives two and three sort of working or already in process in other towns? Um, I think in, so, not in, <coughs> mm -hmm. but in the Main Street America Guide, yes. Mm -hmm. They go, they do a really nice job of going through how did you identify those opportunities, and then how do you market the opportunities to developers, and then begin to engage them in terms of, you know, following through, getting necessary permits, and all of that, right? That's kind of the essence of what that document does. And I think it's a, a fairly good document, and they've done it at a lot of, you know, designated downtowns or Main Street America across the country. Okay. Danny, the other piece I'll say is there are communities that have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, if you take an organization like Downstreet, um, they're getting a lot cheap. The town is giving them $100,000. But they essentially have no mechanism to recover their redevelopment costs. It always comes through at the end. Um, so some communities um, take a more, take a fairly active financing role in some of those projects. So the town will subsidize the redevelopment costs. In some cases, they pay for it. In some cases, the towns will pay for certain infrastructure improvements to the site. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Mike. Most of what, you, what most of what you're proposing are structural changes, things that we could do for analyzing the supply and what we can do. <coughs> Have you looked at anything from either public or private monies to aid in development of sites for, you know, for <coughs> housing? Not specifically. Um, I mean, not beyond what state programs there are. Right. But we haven't thought through how we would apply those state programs at the local level. Now. Well, that's kind of where I'm looking at is how the, you know, I know we're probably not going to locally have a fund, but tap into some other fun of funds that are exist throughout the state and maybe have a sub fund for Waterbury right. to potentially mm -hmm. develop projects. Right. We can definitely uh, we can definitely itemize which ones exist and how they could be used. Okay, thanks. Well,
Well, just to respond to my, I feel like one piece also had to do with that how much and what type. Like, I mean, right. as you well know, there's very different financing for multifamily and single family and different mm -hmm. things like that. So I feel like one of the kind of going in circles we did as a task force was saying like, well, we would like to incentivize these things, but until you know what you want to be incentivizing, so per this first objective around right. some data gathering and assessment, right. that was certainly one yeah. of the, and that's you know, definitely the reason three is three around what the incentives are is kind of like getting the landscape and then what's in a, an incentive to further that. Mm -hmm. yeah, the only reason I mention that is sometimes these, some of these funds dry up and right. getting, a, a, you know, looking mm -hmm. into the future, getting some sort of you know, reservation of, of funding because they may not be there in five years. Um, last year, uh, towards the end of last year, I believe uh, King brought before uh, the board a proposal for a registry or to look into the uh, feasibility of creating a registry for rental housing, both short term and long term. Um, and I'm just wondering where we are on that, uh, and uh, to what extent would the information gained from that help uh, move uh, towards the objectives of the uh, Housing Task Force? Um, we're not far on the registry. I think we'll have something for you um, in about a month, probably just after town meeting day. Hope to be a little further on it, but something came up last week, last week and a half. I heard about that. There's <laughs> also a lot of um, several, several towns to look at in terms of the in that registry. Um, something I can send along to, and I hope it was recorded. Stowe had a very lively meeting mm -hmm. that related to exactly that, so it might be mm -hmm. insightful for us to look at that and anticipate some of those concerns. Right. And Joe, do you have a position on that as to what type of information that would provide to the task force and how needed that is for you? Do we put into the recommendation um, what type of information we would like to see collected from the task force perspective, right? And I, maybe the best example is, you know, Ken and I had an exchange of emails about the Armory Project before it became the new Armory Project, right? And we said, look, this land might be available, right? what kind of housing would you put there? And I basically said, well, I would like to put in there, you know, the kind of housing that we're losing to short-term rentals. And he said, what is that? I said, I don't know, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's the kind of essence of where we are. We just don't know what housing we're losing to short-term rentals. So we don't know when we have opportunities to put more housing <coughs> in, what to put in. And back to Alyssa's point, that's part of why we're trying to do objective one, to understand that a mm -hmm. little bit more. Um, but, you know, the short-term rental, that kind of registry would be able, we would know, you know, the impact is having on the housing stock and what we need to replace. Yeah, I mean, you had some, of what looked to be a fairly specific uh, detailed uh, data already, like 162 uh, short-term rentals right. uh, yeah. in yeah. town. That's a pretty specific number. Um, right. We don't know what, where they are or, you know, what type of housing it is or anything like that, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Other questions? Chris. Hey, Joe, I had a friend of mine there. We were talking about affordable housing there the other day. I was listening to a program on DEB. Uh, they had a guy from the state dealing with and looking at the changes in Act 250 uh, and how that might help with affordable, this, this definition of affordable housing. Um, If and he was talking about areas right now that developers are going in and they're in these nine lot towns uh, <coughs> that they can go in and, and build a nine lot complex without having to go back to, to Act 250, uh, they're thinking about changing some of those rules instead of being able to do nine units, you can do 30 units. Um, and conversation went on and I'm, I'm not sure how that and he talked about well being able to do 30 units you can buy uh, larger quantities of materials and get a discount on it you know I've been in that business for a long time I don't see how that's going to move the needle a whole hell of a lot um, it's one thing to acquire a f housing uh, and 
from what I'm understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm thinking that you guys are talking about multi-unit housing. Is that kind of what you're focusing on? Because that probably get a bigger bang for your buck in those types of structures. Um, yeah, but we do know on the task force we have some members who are looking to move from rentals up to a single family unit, but some kind of infrastructure single family unit, which also are very difficult. So that's part of what we're trying to assess right now, Chris, is what is that? I mean, <coughs> RW, the RW study made a clear recommendation, it was around, I think, one, two bedroom apartments, right? It, no big house, right? but there was no numbers around that. So what I, I guess what the thing about it, I mean, Tom got, kind of got my blood boiling when he was saying that the taxpayers, and I may, you may be talking about maybe like a TIF program or something like that, perhaps, um, that where eventually that comes back to the taxpayers in a sense, right? Um, so my concern is it's all fine to create the housing, but what's the support mechanism after that? Uh, how do those buildings be maintained and, and who pays the taxes, where, the, where does the money come from that, you know, if, if there's subsidized money coming into this, where is that coming from and who does that impact because it's, you know, it's all our dollar in the end. Uh, so there's a lot of questions as to, you know, what, what creates affordable housing in, in the definition of affordable. Um, and I don't even think we're strictly focused on that definition of affordable. That was why on here, we basically, our second uh, uh, point on objective one was, what are the acceptable median income targets for the potential owners of inventory? That's what, I don't think we have a good handle on that. And I do think, Chris, you're right, this is where we're going to come into the, you know, if you want me to build nine units, but you want them at this price, it can't happen, right? You know, so, then what do we do? Do we incentivize that or some way, or do we think about how to get the cost down? But I do, we do need to have, I think, at least a clear idea around what those target income levels are that we're trying to address. And we, don't, we don't have that right now. Good. Any other questions? Any questions online? Speak up, I can't see any hands. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? No, no, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. Appreciate it, Roger. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Oh, I think. Len, did you have a question? No, I just letting you know there's no questions here, but thanks for checking in. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do I, we have a motion to approve the recommended uh, task force objectives for 2021? I make a motion to. <laughs> Approve the Waterbury Housing Task Force Project Task Force uh, 2024 recommended objectives. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yes, Alyssa. I'll take this moment to just shamelessly thank Joe for all of his work as the chair of the task force. I will say, as someone who's really excited about this task force and did not have the capacity to regularly staff it, Joe comes to every meeting with a multi-PowerPoint slide presented or said, I was reading, yeah, he's, no, he's read about. the Londonbury Housing <laughs> Needs Assessment in his spare time to do your comparison research, but just it's volunteer time and you bring a lot to the community and just I think everyone should know how much work you put into yes. moving this task force forward and thank you, so thank you, Joe. Okay. Close job. Uh, the motion is moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank, Thank you. you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the rest of the Okay, next up we have the school use uh, as a polling location. Oh boy. Uh, this should not be contentious at all. Um, do we have uh, some. Uh, Background information from uh, the town manager. Well, you have it from the town clerk, actually. <laughs> town clerk. Okay, clerk. Um, so there's a lot of content here to read. Um, brief background. Last March, March of 2020. Well, first of all, for those of you that were here last year, Mr. Nipsletter came and spoke to us, and I brought it up then that the November 2022 general election at the school was hostile and really uncomfortable. The school didn't want us there. The public didn't want, excuse me, the, the staff didn't want the public there. It was, it was just a really um, 
terrible experience. And um, Mr. Lichletter had sent me an email in March of 2023 just confirming that I didn't need the school for a general election this past November, which I didn't. And it led mm -hmm. me to think everything was going to be fine. He's checking in. He's making sure the calendar reflects the general election. And we it, had that conversation with him. We had it here, yes. Um, right. And then in January, um, the Waitsfield town clerk put out some information that she'd been approached by this, her school board representative, you know, to find a different place to hold her elections. And for the um, general election in November. For the, I, I'm not sure the specifics of the inquiry, Roger. But no. Basically, not in the school. Um, right now, the chatter about town meeting day is just hearsay. I think I haven't. It's, the focus seems to be on the November general election because that's when school's in service. Yeah, the school's out on um, town meeting day, right? It so is, but it's out because of an extended vacation, right? They specifically make their calendar reflect their February break lasting through town meeting day. Um, so not to derail the conversation, my biggest concern right now is the November um, presidential election that's coming up. Partially because one of our staff members is on the school board and is able to feed me a little bit of information, um, I've come to find out that there's a new policy that has just been introduced to the school board that would change their, their use facilities, draft community use of schools facilities policy. So there's a lot of language in here that's concerning to me. Number three on page two. It says the superintendent can deny an application for use of facilities or terminate an individual or group's use for the following reasons. Use that are likely to cause material and substantial disruption to school operations. Obviously, a, any kind of election at Brookside Primary School is a disruption to them because the school's not closed in and, November. And he makes that quite clear in his emails that he, I think, views this as exactly that. Um. Part B of that same thing, I believe that an election is sponsored by both major political parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I've written an email to the four members of the Waterbury School Board. I wrote that email on Thursday. It's in, it's in this staple packet, I think, somewhere near the back. Although I can't find it. Um, I have not heard a response yet, not from any of them, not even a thank you for sending this email to me. Um, so I don't, I, I guess it's an awareness for all of you that I may be um, pushed out of using Brookside Primary School. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not alone. Um, Waitsfield and Warren both hold their elections at school. Um, and, and it's common practice throughout the state in many mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. Roger. Yes, Bill. Yeah, this is an issue that we dealt with the last time. Um, one of the pushbacks that I'm hearing through the grapevine is that, well, you know, elections are on Tuesdays usually, and it's, a, it's an odd day of the week. Um, well, it's too disruptive to parents to have a Tuesday off. You know, we like to, you know, because we've suggested, could you have an in-service training? Take all the teachers to, to Harwood, do an in-service training, and let the schools that have the elections have elections. Well, we like to have our in-service trainings on Mondays or Fridays, so I don't know. And it's, it's, they're saying it's too disruptive to, to schedule it on a Tuesday. Uh, I guess it's in the U.S. Constitution, election day is on a Tuesday, yeah, so, so we, you know, we don't have a lot of wiggle We can't change. We don't have a lot of wiggle room. We're talking about once every two years, right? Even numbered years. And, and all this disruption that they're concerned about you know, if there's three inches of snow with a little glaze of ice tomorrow, they're going to cancel school at 7.15 yes. mm -hmm. in the morning. And the parents have to deal with that in the immediate right now. So if it's on the calendar, you know, at the beginning of the school year, I think parents can figure it out. So if there's anything that we can do, but we, don't, we don't really have another place. Mm -hmm to have an election. How many are on your checklist? 4,000? There's 43. Um, the day I wrote this email, there was 4,373 voters on our checklist. So anyway, that's just my point. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. I just want to clarify. I think I'm kind of, I'm hearing almost two separate things I want to clarify. So it sounds like 
because I did read most of this. One was a request to not have school, right, to make it an in-service, and the school, or the, um, sorry, the superintendent wants to have school, right? He doesn't want to cancel school, just from what I read in the email. Uh, yes, to, to simplify it. Okay. He, he has a list of reasons why. He yeah, yeah, and yeah, I did read it. So he doesn't seem concerned that it's a disruption. But then the other argument is that we're worried, not argument, but the other concern is that we're worried that he is then going to say it's a disruption and then not approve election day at the school. That's the concern. Well, the I am concerned, Danny, because this, all of a sudden this agenda item popped up just now, just as the conversation with him and three town clerks oh, to change new. the school use policy. So, okay. okay. And I believe the policy is on their next agenda. It is on their next agenda, yeah. So they've adopted it, essentially gives them that authority. I mean, he, he essentially has that authority now, as far as I can tell, well, yeah. but it just solidifies his authority to, and, and in the school board meeting, if you go and watch the school board meeting, um, one of our representatives said, so, you know, basically number four gives you permission to tell them they can't have elections in the school. Excuse me, number three. Um, just this email makes it sound like he's like very pro having. I agree, and then and then you can watch that school board meeting and hear him tell you that the common calendar is prohibitive, the midweek in service day is prohibitive. Towns are moving away from using schools, so why can't these three towns move away from it? I even heard there's not a lot of parking, which. I feel like there's ample parking at Brookside Primary School. I don't know why he made that remark. Way, way more um, than a year. Yeah. Um, I talked to the Secretary of State's office today. Um, Will Senning called me, which was fantastic. <coughs> Just had a brief conversation with him. There's nothing he recommends that we're not already doing. Um, so he recommended reaching out to Vermont School Board Association. Liz is doing that. He recommended the Board of Education. Liz is doing that. He recommended I email the school board. I've done that. Um, the only thing I haven't done is sat down with Mike Lichletter and had a conversation. Um, and I'm reluctant to do that because I feel very, I feel like he holds all the cards. I, the, other than begging him to let me have it there, I don't really know what more I can say that I haven't said already. Um, so if there's an email that can be drafted or a letter that can be written to, Invite him in to have a conversation about this. When's their um, next meeting with this agenda? Uh, um, I'm not certain of that actually. Even though Mike probably told me, I'm not 100 certain. Does Lisa know? Uh, okay. Next week, next Wednesday. I was next gonna, Wednesday. I was going to say, is this that one rare occasion where we need to meet with our select or with our school board delegates over an issue that requires both of our attention? You can invite them and they respond. I'm disappointed that I didn't even get a thank you so much. I'll look into this for you. I'm just my response might be that uh, you could, we could certainly talk with our particular representatives, but I also think uh, talking directly with the superintendent might uh, promote the, uh, um, coming to, together uh, to, to try to solve the common problem. But, I say this as an individual, not as a select board member. Mm -hmm. The building is a public building. Elections are an institution. Uh, there are limited places in this and many other communities to have elections. I think as Bill Sheplock said, they'll close the school for three <coughs> inches of snow, but they can't stay open for for, for an election. I, I see something wrong with that problem. And I don't I know I will be glad to attend that meeting as well to voice my my opinion on that. Because I think, you know, if it's disruptive for school, fine. Close close the school for the day. You know, there are so many days that they have snow days, take take one snow day away. And I, I just think it should be, it's a place, it's, elections to me, I hold very sacred. And it's very important that uh, we have places to have 
I, I understand their safety issues, safe elections, if they want to clo clo close the school if they think it's going to be a big issue. Uh, Alyssa. I'm just thinking about what our next action steps are in terms of it does appear this is a little time sensitive. Um, Karen, it sounds like you feel like you've done everything. You've reached out to these folks. In terms of next steps, you know, obviously we can reach out as individual members and select board members to the reps. I am just going to say out loud, no one filed petitions to run for school board for our town for next year. And I do have to say, like, because it's a thankless job, because we're all sitting here doing this. And I just feel like I need to say that out loud because here, it, here. no one wins. And if we all really have a problem, there, two people can run right in campaigns to be Waterbury school board representatives. So I, I wish they responded to. I have certainly not responded to every email I've ever gotten as a select board member. Um, but what do we think is most effective in terms of you know, again, if this is for consideration Wednesday, I guess I personally am trying to weigh the adversarial versus not adversarial approaches um, and kind of how, what we as a board do. Are we writing a collective letter? Are we meeting with reps? Are we going to the meeting Wednesday? All of the above. But, you know, it feels like there is, we're looking ahead to November. Um, we obviously have town meeting more imminently. There's this policy, but, but what are our action steps? I have a suggestion. I think Karen's email that she sent to our school board members was artfully written. And if you agree with that email, you can endorse the, sen endorse the statement. And, and then that's your official position on the matter. Mm -hmm. And Karen will then, in further communication, Karen and myself will have that endorsement behind it in support of the select board. The meeting next Wednesday, the 14th? The meeting next Wednesday, to the best of my knowledge, is to consider the policy change. I, I have not been informed yet what the calendar looks like. I haven't officially been told that I can't use the school because they haven't finalized their calendar. Right, and that's what I want to be careful of. So no one in these emails, except for parents and people in our side, for lack of a better word, has said it's disruptive. So we have said that, but town clerks have said that, parents have said that, the school has not said that. So before we attack the school for calling it disruptive, let's remember that that's not in here. They may have verbally in other places, but they have it here. So before we knee jerk react to that, they also didn't say they can't do it. So in our writing and request, let's remember that, let's remember to react to what's actually happened and then ask for what we need as a town for our people and continue the best type of relationship we can because we could create a problem where there isn't one and I don't want us to do that because that's going to make your job a lot harder. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, it occurs to me, you know, as I head into this, now that the Secretary of State's office mails ballots, yes, there's 4,300 voters on the checklist, yes, 3,500 of them voted in the last um, general election. But now ballots are being mailed. So there, the, the possibility exists that over time, the capacity is lower and lower. Like, I don't need such a big space. But imagine me running a general election in this room, because that's what I'm going to have to do. Um, I need ADA accessibility. I, there's certain things I have to have, and I can't just go find that somewhere. So this is the spot if I can't use the school. So for me, and I appreciate, Danny, what you're saying. I mean more for us and or the public yeah. listening when we reach out, let's make it, let's help you and not hurt you yeah. by creating Well, I want to help myself too. Storm. I'm, I, I feel like I did communicate with Mr. Litchletter in advance. Um, I was shocked when this came up again as if no conversation had ever taken place. Anyway, um, I appreciate what you're saying, but this is the space. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can't use the school, <laughs> because I don't have another spot that I can use. Uh, Chris? Yeah, a couple questions and maybe a comment. Um, did the superintendent come up with this, or is it the school board that basically put the statement out? Um, there's no, I don't believe there's a statement, Chris. There's a slew of emails here. The proposed policy. The proposed policy. Um, the superintendent asked the crosswalk committee, which is a group of individuals on the school board that review policies, specifically asked them to review that policy. Uh, you know, we ask a lot of our school systems, but it's what we ask of them is also compensated for. Uh, 
to have a one-year election in a facility that we've used for how many decades now? Uh, maybe the legislators ought to be contacted to perhaps try to get something through the state house to cast that in stone. Right, hence the yeah, outreach that to with the all of our tax dollars that we put into the school systems to request one day a year for an election facility. I don't think it's too much to ask. Uh, it's you know, it, it makes me sick to my stomach to hear that because it's just to me, it's another sign of the Vermont that I used to know just kind of slowly disappearing and it's it's saddening. I hope I hope we can work this thing out. This is Lisa Walton. Can I say something please? Uh, sure. Lisa. Hi. Um I couldn't hear all of uh, what Chris was saying, but um I am really surprised to hear that the superintendent of our school would be suggesting for even a moment that the uh, community members would not be uh, welcome to use the school for the purpose of voting. Um, I know that everyone probably in that room would be surprised if that's truly the case. Hopefully there's been some sort of miscommunication here, but I would hope that if in fact this is the direction that the superintendent is leaning that the school board as a, I'm sorry, the select board as a whole, as well as the town manager uh, would in no uncertain terms, write a letter or make a statement that says that they, you know, uh, absolutely are opposed to not being allowed to use the school for this purpose. Um, I don't think this should even be a question. And it would shock me if, if we didn't do something that that showed that the select board stands with the um, townspeople of Waterbury on something like this. So again, I, I understand what um, was said about our not wanting to jump to unnecessary conclusions and causing a problem before there is one. But I think Karen is very wise in trying to address this before it becomes a problem and make sure that you know our rights as citizens are protected here. So, so Roger, excuse me, I didn't get to finish, but, but so my last thing was going to be, you know, maybe we could put some thought or try to figure out if we did not, if we weren't able to use it, what alternatives do we have before, mm -hmm. it's, before it's too late, if anybody can pull that rabbit out of their hat. <laughs> well, now there are some... Other halls. The, arm, the armor you Yeah. <laughs> um, American Legion, St. Leo's. Yeah, Mike. What their superintendent portrays in his memo talks about violence and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I know he's talking about many of the school shootings. Any of these school shootings and stuff like that could happen any day of the school year, not necessarily in, a, in an election mm -hmm. day. Uh, and I just think it's so, you know, well, what do we want to do? Shut the, shut the schools down to have a secure fortress there? I just, you know, if, if we need to have, you know, if they want to have um, the sheriff be at the, be at the premises, I, I have no problem with that because if they feel uncomfortable. But I, I'm kind of like where our ex-town manager, Bill Sheplow, you know, they could move the in-service day. It just sounds like an inconvenience for them to move move their in-service day. And I just, I'm just appalled. Yeah. So I think the questions are the table. So per Tom's point, we can endorse Karen's thing. Karen is asking for two things. One, the use of the school. And two, the students not being in the school when we use the school. And I think we have like those two separate issues. I don't think that request has been formally made, but this email is potentially right, saying there's a question. It's just saying that there's concerns. I just want to be clear about what has or hasn't been proposed. And then there's a draft policy for next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So for each of those, what's our response? Do we want to endorse Karen's email? Which is, I read Karen's email as saying that she is one, would like to use Brookside Primary School for the location this November, and two, she would like to use it when there is not school in session. 
I, I having students in the school, I do think that the safest course of action is to not have school. Oh, and to be clear, I, yeah, and I'm just saying, in endorsing your policy, we're, we're agreeing with both those points. We're yeah. saying that one, we would really love to have it at the school where we've had it for many years, and two, we think that doing that successfully based on past experience and mm -hmm. community feedback we and you received mm -hmm. needs to be done without school. So those are our two asks. Mm -hmm. um, we're willing to take A without B because I <coughs> worried about. Uh, if they're not willing to do an in-service day for whatever reason, you know, do then we say, fine, we're not doing it there, kids are there, or we just need to do it there and we'll deal with the student piece at a longer term, or are you thinking like, if, if they won't do in-service or whatever, then we don't want to do it there, period. It's a great question, Danny. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I have kids at that school. But, yeah. Uh, for the safety of the kids, for the safety of the community, it would be great if they could schedule an in-service day. I, I watched the video of the school board meeting. I heard him say that one of the biggest challenges was what he called the common calendar. I called the superintendent of the Central Vermont uh, Career Center, which was the calendar he was referring to. She confirmed for me that the Central Vermont Career Center will not be closed on November 5th and it is not reflected to be closed on the school calendar. So he has, he can deviate from that calendar by four days. Mm -hmm. So he, there is, I suppose, still the slight glimmer of hope that you will decide to take one of those four days and apply it to November 5th. Um, but how, I don't know how long that's gonna sustain. Right. I, I guess in hindsight, I should have, absolutely emailed him and asked him, did you give me November 5th off from school? Um, but it seems like all the, all the, everything I'm seeing is pointing towards that not being the reality. Um, so an, an awareness, I guess. But what do I know about school common calendars is they're very, very strict. You'll notice if there's a snow day, it's always district-wide, even though districts are large and it might not impact the whole area. So it's part of their core belief is to maintain that calendar. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment on a comment that was made um, by a member of the public about Americans' rights being taken away. Um, the school superintendent, by sending this email, is not threatening to take away your rights as an American. We still have options to vote in places. It just might not be the school. Um, you know, uh, it might be here. It would be really inconvenient to hold a general election in this room, it's very small. Um, but no, we are not, our, our, <coughs> our constitutional rights are not under threat because the school doesn't want to host the general election. So, so to follow up, as individuals, we can write to both the superintendent and the school board members representing the select board and ourselves as individuals and members of the public in the same to officially endorse requests um, we can show up at the meeting on Wednesday next week if we're available to do mm -hmm. so, to listen and ask questions and voice opinions. Um, and just, I want to emphasize in this meeting, he says like it requires more conversation and exploration and he's open to a meeting with town right. clerk. So again, for the like. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, the, and then the, but the, then the policy came after that, the draft policy, right? So right. we just want to be as much a part of that policy conversation as possible. We want well, our, uh, our town manager has uh, suggested one course of action is for us to endorse the letter that uh, our town clerk has uh, written. I think it's mm -hmm. uh, not inflammatory in any particular way. Uh, do I have a motion? I make a motion that the select board endorses um, the town clerk's letter to the uh, superintendent. Excuse me. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. This letter uh, is endorsed uh, and will, can be sent with the uh, select board's endorsement. Um, and perhaps we can determine uh, who amongst us might be available to go uh, address the school board uh, next Wednesday. My wife's just going to love me going there on 
Well, I don't think we can uh, afford to have uh, more than uh, two of us there, so uh, yeah, no, we'll prompt the you can. Valentine's Day. Valentine's yeah. Day. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a great date. I've been Day married to uh, 23 years, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, uh, I, I wouldn't mind going uh, trying to pursue our interests in a way that's not uh, necessarily uh, Counterproductive. I would. I would like. To, <coughs> I'll take my wife. I go oh, date, 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 date night. Now you know. How to talk. Okay. <laughs> I will watch the recording. <laughs> <laughs> I will be a heat foot. <laughs> More fun. You're too you're, um, you're you're going to them on Valentine's Day. No, that's oh, not. Well, my wife doesn't care about homework. <laughs> All right, now let's move on to the last item on the agenda, or maybe next to last, uh, the FEMA buyout. Oh, yes. Do we have it? Right no, you don't have any. No. You don't have any of the work. Last minute came in on the Friday. Let me just make sure that the address is correct on this one. Excuse us, let's hold the top. Danny Carpenter and Tasha Green, and the address is, geez, what? Of course, it's never on page one. 1930 U.S. Route 2, which is Route 2 mm -hmm. on the right just before Jenny Davis, one of the last houses. Mm -hmm. um, flooded, flooded pretty badly both times. Um, it's a livable, I understand. The owner's in it, um, but sick and tired of being flooded. The interesting, it's a standard buyout process from our perspective if the select board approves it. The interesting component about this one, which will come out later, is it is double wide and it can be moved, and that may be a possibility. Uh, no need to demolish it. So, so perhaps she can get some buyout funds and find a lot elsewhere. Um, and maybe that's a, the best move solution for ground. everyone. Move to higher ground. Yes. So she's not 100% committed to it, but she's interested in exploring the option. And. Um, so the, the buyout would just be oh, like condemning the property, essentially, uh, buy, buying the lot. Yeah, from our perspective, in the end, it'd be the same, same process. We don't have land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, We're going to be the proud uh, owner of a lot of pocket parks here. I need to make these signatures. I can uh, notarize it. All right. Uh, I have a motion. I'll move to approve the buyout request for 1830 U.S. Route 2. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We can all sign the uh, buyout uh, request. And just say, Tommy, what would you like? Like, I guess I would just like say we've had you know a small smattering of these in places that are flooding, so it seems like it's in the town's best interest. Is there a threshold? It's where we're concerned. Oh, yeah, it says it on the top. <laughs> so it's easy to probably in great detail. Yeah. We may have a couple more. Yeah, I guess I, that was my point, just around threshold of concern. I mean, to be clear, I think if these are perpetually flooding properties, we shouldn't be concentrating further development there. And if folks want to do this, we should support that. Um, you know, I know in other communities, just because of number, they're much more concerned about it. Um, yeah, that, I don't think we're quite there yet. I'd honestly like to see a few more. Um, that, that one owner talking with myself and the state emergency management person about an elevation. In general, the rules related to elevations don't work unless it's a pretty high value property. Yeah. And likely without the owner having some personal investment, too. Um, I really would like to see two or three more buyout properties. Yeah. I'm not sure they'll come to fruition. And is the state still covering the 25% match as of now? Thus far, um, I have not heard about any buyout being approved in any communities as yet. So I think they're picking and choosing rather carefully. All right. Um, this is. There's only room for two signatures here. Yeah, we'll just keep going. Yeah, just keep going. Like, yeah. yeah, just pile them in. Pile them in like before. And... All right. Last 
time on the agenda is next meeting, which will be Monday the 19th of February. Uh, that is a uh, federal holiday, President's Day. Um, Happy birthday, George Washington. Right. Well, his is actually the 22nd, but uh, it's general events <coughs> now, don't have residents. The 12th and the 22nd is to for real birthdays. Hmm? Lincoln's the 12th. Yeah, Lincoln's the 12th, and Washington's place and I don't know when Biden's is or any of <laughs> uh, There'll be too many holidays. Right. That's why they just no, narrow it down to one. Uh, no, I, Unless there's a, a particular concern, I think Monday nights work for most of us and other nights are problematic. So uh, I'd like to just keep it on the uh, holiday. It's not a holiday for the, uh, for the town. Uh, so there. Uh, and the agenda. Very short. Was that in the packet? Mm -hmm. Here, I have mine. Oh, yeah. Quicker. Yeah, so that'd be helpful. All right. I do. So um, we have uh, the, the usual uh, first three, and then uh, an update on the armory building. Um, any particular new information that we expect to have uh, to be able to present? Um, yes. If nothing else, our official position, if you will, on the issue. Um, may have some additional information from uh, other communities that have similar shelters and some, some shelter operators, too, to talk about the community impact and what we can do to prepare if, in fact, it comes to fruition. Are we having the meeting here, though? Yeah, I wonder, what do, you, what do you expect? Obviously, we needed the uh, larger room. Uh, School gymnasium. some volleyballers <laughs> off. Um, I don't know, it certainly did attract a lot of attention uh, yeah. last time. I don't I wouldn't necessarily expect everyone to want to come back and uh, hear, uh, express the same things that they've already expressed or hear maybe some of the same information, but uh, we will have new information. Maybe it would make sense to uh, move it back to the uh, firehouse if they'll have us. I think it's smart. Yeah, so listen. I don't want to be the one that would have like, or should it be here and should we pay for a large Zoom meeting room for right. that? The, the, I just felt bad both for Karen and for folks online with that. And I know it was out of everyone's control, but before we immediately go back there, that is my hesitation. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a good idea. Because people might just want, they don't necessarily feel like they need to stand up, but they really want to be here for the update. Mm -hmm. And if we could increase the capacity. Was, was it solely the fire department the issue for the connectivity for Zoom? I think it was just overused. I, mean, I think it's people. just, I think we'll have the, the same problem anywhere if we have that many bodies on it. That's why I was addressing. But there are Zooms that are coming. Yeah, so there's two the mechanics. People. You can pay for, we do at work because we do right. town wide community Big meetings. Ones. You can pay for a large meeting. You do have to pay for it. Right. So, so we hit the capacity last time, which was one phase of Zoom confusion. And then folks who stayed on until the end, what, there were six of them, I think had disconnected eight times by the end, which mm -hmm. I'm sure was challenging. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. if I can speak it? to it, I sure. don't feel confident about the internet connection at either building. Yeah. So, <laughs> whether you pay for more capacity on Zoom or not, I think we run the same risk. I think we run, I mean, this, the internet went out here tonight and there was 10 people on and it, and it shut down and recycled, so. After the, after the meeting, I talked to Bob Butler, who does our IT work, and I said, let's, let's figure out fiber options for this building, mm -hmm. which we don't have right now. I, I'm assuming there's a trunk line down Main Street. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, hopefully I'm not wrong, but it'd be nice to get fiber at both buildings and then these connectivity issues are gone because the size of our pipe is, you know, a thousand next bigger, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in, if we don't have uh, much guarantee of a reliable uh, Zoom 
connection uh, then uh, maybe asking Gary if we can go back to the firehouse where it make most sense. <coughs> if they clear that projector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, hopefully that. in the next two weeks is the... Uh, yeah. I don't know. Can we consult with Bob Butler to see if, you know, some sort of technology issues he can help us with? Uh, we can, I mean, but, are, but this is two, two weeks away. Uh, two weeks uh, away. So I don't well, know. maybe it's an easy fix. Do you, do you think, Tom, we'd have any updates on the state's um, surveying of the Stanley Watson site? Um, I can give you that yes and no. Um, I'm expecting them to give us a draft purchase and sale pretty soon. They updated and completed their survey. They have to go before our DOV <coughs> to amend their site plan as part of that, too. So it's unfortunately a little bit of a process in the end. Who's and that? I think that the state, I think that also requires amending their active 50 permit for the site. Subdivision is development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it all takes a little longer than you hope it takes. Yeah. Oh, well, I just thought, you know, two weeks away. I thought maybe they'd have moved an inch. Do we uh, have consensus that we were going to ask Gary to move uh, to the uh, to the firehouse for the meeting on the 19th? Yep. And what I'll look into, and I think we can accomplish by then, we can check it out in the next few days, is maybe just a basic PA system. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Which would have been nice, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was difficult to project to... For all plus I can definitely here. bring you a head, a speaker cab, and a microphone. Well, we had those things. Oh. Gary had a Gary had a microphone and a like a portable Wi-Fi speaker. I couldn't connect to the speaker. I couldn't connect Zoom to the speaker. Mm -hmm. The microphone connected to the speaker. Um, however, when we tested it, the room was empty and it just echoed, <laughs> yeah. and it just felt totally completely overwhelming. Now, in hindsight. 100 people in the room probably would have dampened the blow, but Gary does have those items available at the fire station for our use, and it was a decision that we made not to use them because of the reverberation. So um, it's not necessary to buy them or bring them or even uh, secure them. They're, they're right there. And maybe we should encourage people to attend in person because that might limit the internet connections and may help things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you know, I mean, I'll plug I'll into the wall this. this time, so I won't run on Wi-Fi. Yeah. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll bring an Ethernet and plug into yeah. the wall. We'll go down and test yeah. it ahead of time. I'll do everything I can to yeah. avoid the same no, issues. Oh, we know you'll do the right thing. But, mm -hmm. um, but I, and if I felt like being here yeah, would no hurt. provide <laughs> me that security, I'd say, let's stay home. It's comfy and warm. But yeah. I feel like the same exact thing could happen, and um, especially with increased capacity. So. Yeah. Kane and then Chris. Um, a recommendation for next meeting is that I, I don't want to sound like an idiot here, but the traffic for the eclipse is going to be jaw dropping if numbers are correct. I think we just, you know, skeleton of a plan for if people get locked in or locked out, especially mm -hmm. employees of local businesses. I know she said phone it in but uh, I can't really phone in my spatula. <laughs> I think those conversations, Tom, are happening though. Mm -hmm. between you and I think they're pretty actively happening and RW is leading yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. A lot okay. of um, Maybe an update from your, here. Your point is well taken about the downtown parking and room for employees. Yeah. Uh, so well, well, that hasn't been something I've been involved with specifically in the conversation, but I think that's a good point. We can incorporate into things. If, if we do that, we might want to have Katarina here because she's working a lot with Karen on, you know, the eclipse plans. So does that belong yeah, on well, the agenda, she, Tom? Maybe not. You know, uh, Tom was working directly with Katarina as well, so right. I can decide whether she needs to be here or he can just represent. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so is it, is it a clear understanding that there's no pathway out of this uh, armory issue? Um, <coughs> So, I wouldn't say that. Um, a lot of people have been asking me. I mean, they, the commissioner showed up to the meeting. I think that meant something that he was there personally and not an underling, and he didn't have to do that, I didn't think. I thought it was a good move, but he didn't have to. Our position is they still need to go before the DRB for a change of use permit for the building. Um, 
all of our bylaws don't apply because it's a state facility and they're exempt from some of them, but some of them still do apply and I think there's gonna be some legitimate questions asked by the DRB. If they wanna get that done by April 1st, they better get their permit application in soon because there's a process to advertising those meetings um, and they've essentially missed February already. So they can't, um, they can't strong <coughs> their way through this? Permit's a permit. They need a permit like anyone else. Um, and then there's a series I'm working on some formalized questions about what we can ask them, and, and that's a pretty long list. Um, I spent most of the day talking with people who are in this business um, to try to get some expert advice on, on what questions we should ask and what impacts we should anticipate. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. That's really all I did today, trying to have that done for internal review as soon as I can, and some of those folks who are in this business are gonna work on it with me to give me some help. Um, I recognize I'm not an expert in homeless facilities and how they may or may not impact communities. Um, and I think then we'll, we'll take it from there. But I'm, you know, part of what I'm hopeful is, you know, the state has a very long relationship with Waterbury. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I think you can think of Waterbury as, as a town with a, you know, an old, an old school town with a big factory. And, and, the, and, the, and the factory served the townspeople well. There are a lot of jobs over the years. And, and we still have that to some extent, and that's a good thing to have. And I think also the state views us as a pretty willing partner. Um, so I think if they go forward with a proposal and don't work with us, and there's a negative community impact, I think it's gonna make it hard for them to work with us in the future. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that they'll be cognizant of that long-term relationship, the fact that they've got such a built presence here and, and understand our concerns. And most of what I'm learning is the state has a set of guidelines for homeless shelter operators, but those guidelines for the most part say it's on the operator to develop the actual policies and procedures. And so I read those guidelines today and I'm trying to figure out um, if we can get a seat at the table to talking with an operator to make sure we understand what their procedures are. And so we know, okay, the state rules say there's a process for, in essence, evicting someone from a homeless shelter. And, there's an, and, and that's a requirement, and there's also an appeals process. But I'm curious what happens if someone is evicted. Um, and, and April can be bad weather. So... I wanna make sure that person is safe and I wanna make sure that there's a process for, for all of this. And so it's understanding all these things at a pretty detailed level. And I fully admit I'm not an expert on these guidelines, so I'm, I'm reading these things for the first time. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to make sure that um, I understand this fully, I can bring that knowledge to the select board in the community and, and we can go from there. Um, and I'll also say a lot of everything I'm hearing from communities that have homeless shelters are that homeless shelters with strong operators with strong guidelines um, don't impact public services of the community in a negative way. But I'm also learning that those shelters tend to be quite a bit smaller than what's proposed for Waterbury as of today. The, the, the normal number seems to be 15 to 20. There's no absolute number. There's bigger, there's smaller. Um, and even the shelter operators I've talked with have said, I've talked a lot about how homeless shelters have evolved a lot in the last few years. Um, I talked to a shelter op operator today who said that for years their, their shelter was closed during the day and, and that, was, that worked for the community and um, that simply doesn't work anymore. So they're now a 24-7 operator and it, and, and it doesn't work because the individuals that were in their shelter are increasingly impacting public places like libraries and not always a positive way. And so the shelter operator and the guidelines they use are what it mostly boils down to. And so I think if we can have a seat at that table, I think we can be in pretty good standing. Um, and I also feel like, and I'll be quite frank, um, April 1 is really tough. I, it's, it's a struggle for me to see them pulling that off. Maybe they can. Um, and it's also a struggle for me to see them investing in that building and only doing it for 90 days. To me, that doesn't, doesn't add up. Um, 
you know, the, the number, I don't know if this is true, the number I've heard by three people in the business, let's say, from their conversations with state officials is $2 million that they're planning and putting into the building. I have no $2 idea if that's true, in but th that's just what I've heard, so I don't want to perpetuate it too much, but if you take $2 million and divide by 40 beds and divide by that $140 at a night they're spending now, it's a year to recover that investment. Mm -hmm. Teresa made that point. In Teresa made that exact point, um, not knowing the exact numbers, but um, even if the investment was half of that, um, 90 days isn't a lot of time to recover it, and um, Bill Woodruff was up there a couple weeks ago talking to the construction manager who was working out plans for a, a sprinkler system. Um, it's a big building. Um, putting a sprinkler system in a building when you've got web-based paint issues and asbestos issues to work around doesn't strike me as free. It strikes me as a fairly expensive six-figure proposition. So. Um, it's also got, you know, the showers are gang-style military showers. I'm imagining they're going to do some renovations to the bathroom to make them a bit more private. Never mind the rest of it. So it, I understand that every, every unit they would build would have power, um, even if it's plywood and two-by-fours. That's all a fair amount of time and money if you're talking 40 units, building those, bringing power to them. Um, so, so I, I'm going to call time on this. This is not on the agenda for tonight. Fair this enough. is for the next meeting. Yeah. No. So, so, no. I'm Chris. I'm saying. No. I was just going to tell you with the fire station. So there's a lot of people that have told me that they would have gone to that meeting if they'd known about it. So now they do know about it. So I I just want you to be prepared for a full house the next time. If, yeah. You know, and I always that possibility. That was the reason that we did not put it on the agenda tonight was that a lot of people have questions, very reasonable questions. We don't have a lot of answers quite yet. Tom's got more than yeah. many of us do, but we're going to be addressing it on the 19th. Yeah. Sorry, I got Roger, was there, there was one other thing earlier you said that we were going to maybe put on the next agenda, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, well, we've got two things here. We've got the 10-year budget. Maybe that's going to be a little oh, less than the 10-year budget. Yeah. We've got the good fire hearing, and then um, there's a proposal that uh, crew organize a flood fair. Uh, I don't know if they've got a date yet, uh, but if they have more information, we could put it on the agenda as well. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest, I'm going to vote we push 10 year budget plan. I just, yeah. we have animal control ordinance that we had on the agenda that we took off. We had noise and other. I'm not, all due respect, because I want to do it. I think we should do it, but I think doing it for the 19th, especially when Tom has so many other things on his plate, is not realistic. We can put in and I think we're yeah. going to need more update on the honorary time. I don't think that's going yeah. to be sufficient. Well, these are just uh, right. I, plot, I, I plot know. Numbers. Yeah, we should put it in the parking lot. I want to do it, but I don't mm -hmm. think by next year it's realistic. Okay, so um, we do need to put the uh, animal control ordinance back on the agenda. Well, it does, I mean, Tom, I that was a Tom thing too, so I don't. I, I can have that. Talk. I can have that in two weeks. Do I, I'm not saying it's my like it's low on my list of priorities, but it was got bumped. So do we want to take this meeting where we're talking, uh, we're spending probably more than an hour on the, the army armory again. To uh, do we want to open with the parking ordinance? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Open with the park. Yeah, it's right there. It's fantastic. <laughs> That also has to do with the. Also, I will say, everyone, you should mark your calendars Plus, for yeah. both dates because we just heard that the planning commission is the Tuesday, is their public hearing. Right. The 20th, if Martha was correct. So, fun week. Um, they, I think, will have a Zoom. Okay. I may have lost yeah. track. I have Good Fire, Crew Flood Fair, and Eclipse Parking on the agenda, and I have a 10 year budget plan in the parking lot. We're moving the animal ordinance to the agenda. Is that what I do? Keep it in the parking lot. Keep it in the parking lot? Yeah, I'd prefer to do yeah. that. Yeah. And that just okay. adds. So leave the majority. We're not going to be in a good mental headspace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or depending on the level of public comment, right. maybe Even a lot of night already. Who's going to be yeah. when? Yeah, okay. I'll, we can work this out on Friday. Yeah. If that okay. works for you. Yeah, it sure does. And if anything else comes up, uh, you can let me know. I'll bring the whiskey. Hmm? I'll bring the whiskey. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second.
Put them in the second and all of them say aye. 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 aye.